Good morning. Welcome to the service of worship from the Pendleton Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you are here with us. However you are worshiping with us, we all pray for God's blessing today. The announcements are in your bulletin, and we do not have any new announcements other than to welcome Miss Brenda Goodwin to uh, accompany us on the piano and the organ today. Most of you all know Brenda. She's been with us before, and we really appreciate her filling in and offering her uh, talents to us this morning. Let us now begin to worship. three hundred and sixty nine. to your bulletin for the prayer of confession and let us pray together forgive us O God when we hinder Christ's gospel we distort the good news because we do not follow his commands we seek safety rather than Jesus's leadership our comfort becomes our confession have mercy upon our misplaced devotion and in our Lord's grace hear our confession as we seek to repent Amen. And hear these words of assurance. God's covenant has been fulfilled in the raising of Jesus. Let it be known that through Jesus' forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. All who believe are thereby free from bondage in Christ 
is new life for all who repent. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Thank you again for placing your offerings in the lock boxes in each of our vestibules. And refer to your bulletin, please, for the prayer of dedication for our offerings. And let us pray together. O oh God, we offer these gifts you bestow abundantly upon us. Take them and blend them into a composite of commitment. Empower our hands to reach out to others. Enlighten our minds to see your will. May what we give support your church's endeavors, as in Christ's name we seek to faithfully respond to your will. Amen. A reading from the Old Testament this morning is taken from the book of Zechariah, and I shall read to you from the third chapter, verse 4, here, the Word of God. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And to him he said, See, I have taken your guilt away from you, and I will clothe you with festal apparel. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. Let us now come together in a moment of prayer, beginning in silence as you offer the prayers that are in your hearts. Let us pray together.
And now <clears throat> let us join together <clears throat> in a moment of prayer. Gracious God, you have made all of us your children, formed by your design, destined for your purposes, for which we praise you as our creator and acknowledge you as our Lord. You have given us assurance of your love, coming into this world in Jesus of Nazareth, so that we may know you. As by his example, we know the dimensions of your concern, we are bold enough to pray, not as if to awaken you to your work, but rather that we may ourselves be guided by the doing of it. Therefore, O oh God, we pray, help us to feed the poor and help us to share our affluence. O oh God, heal the sick and help us to reach with compassion to any who are afflicted. Our God, cause justice and truth to prevail and help us to be brave enough to live justly with all of our neighbors. O oh God, prosper your church. Help us to rightly understand your will for this, the body of our Lord on earth, and then do it. O oh God, counsel our rulers. Help us to participate in the democratic process that we will be governed by those who represent us and not by tyrants. O oh God, bring peace on earth and help us to overcome our silence and our fear so that by the express will of your people, wars will cease. We live in hard and dangerous times, our Father, and our heads swim with the pressure of what happens even as our hearts are heavy. Come to us in our distress, help us to recognize and to use your strength. Give us new assurances of your love and new confidence in your eternal purpose. So may it be that our weakness is overcome by your power and we may have the joy of those who view the morning through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit now and forever, and who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
from the New Testament this morning, I shall read to you from the Gospel of Luke, from the 15th chapter, verses 11 through 24, as you hear again the Word of God. A very familiar story about the prodigal of the younger and the older brother and the father. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. <coughs> a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. And he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have enough bread and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and put his arm around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And we pray in the spirit of our living Christ that our understanding might be added. Some years ago, Carl Memminger wrote in his book entitled, Whatever Became of Sin, claims that this word sin has almost dropped out of our modern vocabulary. Many conservative thinkers turn all of sin into a crime, while most liberal thinkers, they reduce all of sin to sickness. And in the process, he says, society has been the loser. He does not deny that jails and hospitals are involved in the larger understanding of the sin process. He insists, however, that sin has to do with your identity and my identity and our human power. And we all find ourselves in our lives in sin. It is impossible for us not to be so because we are incomplete creatures we struggle with it. We try to change it to fit our notion of what the world should be, what our lives should be, what people think about us and what we think about others. We change pronouns in order to accommodate the things that we wish to be identified by, at least some do in our world today. And it is what we do with the power, the human power, that you and I possess that makes a difference in the world around us. Whether we acknowledge it or whether we do not, we all, as I said earlier, are involved in sin because we are incomplete. And it's not just a matter for society to deal with in a very responsible way, but it is also a very, very high priority for this 
and all of the churches of Jesus Christ. The basic thing that is wrong with the world is sin. It's trying to be something that our Creator never had in mind when He designed us as His greatest creation. I'm fairly sure that when you, as I, hear the word sin, we begin to think of a long list of don'ts or do nots. The old saw was when I was a teacher, or rather when I wish when I was a teacher, when I was a teenager was, we don't dance, smoke, or chew. And we don't date girls who do. <laughs> now if you could set, if you could set that image apart for a moment, and begin to think of sin in terms of our identity, your identity, my identity, identity, and the power that we possess over ourselves and reflect to others in our lives. Sin is what happens when we choose not to be our true selves, which means that it always results in a misuse of our power, and it winds up hurting other human beings, including ourselves. From the time that Adam and Eve refused to be their true selves, and they ate of the fruit from the forbidden tree, it is true that others have always been hurt. For you see, sin, it's never just against laws or recommendations or precautions. Sin is always against people. Now that sounds very abstract. The saying that one picture is worth a thousand words, so let me remind you of the story that I just read to you a few moments from the gospel. Here is a very clear picture of identity and power. As you recall, the story began simply enough However, the intent of the younger son is not anything at all simple. He resented being under the authority of his father and his elder brother and even perhaps whatever supervisors were there on the farm. And he did not like the prospect of being a younger partner in this business for as long as his elder brother lived. He longed for the day <clears throat> when he could get out from under all authority and there would be no one to tell him what he could do. He honestly seemed to think that he could just get away from his home environment. Then he could bend the world into whatever shape he chose. So one day, as you know, he did a very arrogant thing he walked in and demanded that the portion of the property that would eventually come to him, something that he had not earned, be given to him now. Now remember, this young man had an identity problem. He did not yet know <laughs> or accept limits for his own place under the rule and order of the world and so he walked in and said to his father I wish you were dead just give me the portion that you would give me if you were dead and let me go with it and strangely enough the father did he gave in to that boy's desire and he converted part of his estate into cash and the young man sets out for what we are only told is the far country, and there his real education began. And lo and behold, he found life was a great deal more complicated than he ever imagined. And life and other people, they refused to be bent into whatever shape he wished them to be. Paul Tillich, who was one of my professors, at Union Seminary in Richmond, wrote that reality is that which we come up against it. We have to adjust 
because it will not adjust to us. What came through to this young man loud and very clear was he did have limits. He could not bend reality into his own desires. And in a relatively short amount of time, he lost all that his father had given him, all that his father and perhaps his grandfather's had been wise enough to earn and to save. He had wasted it all and now had the ignominy of feeding someone else's pigs and not even eating as well as them. Now with this water, under his bridge of life, our Lord says, he came to himself. He faced up that he did have limits. But now notice the very subtle thing happens in this story. He began to swing from one position of life to another. From wanting, first of all, to have total freedom and thinking that he possessed enough power to arrange his life and the lives of all of those around him to suit his purposes, now we see him wanting to think of himself as having no power. He must be totally dependent upon others. He decides to go back home. And his motive was not one of the very best. He wanted to go back home, not because he missed his father and his family, but rather he needed food and lodging. However, to give him a little bit of a benefit of a doubt, I think he wanted to make a clean breast of things with his father and say, I am no longer worthy of being your son. Make me one of your hired servants. And here again, he falls into a trap. You have seen in your lifetime, I'm sure many others, who have fallen into the same trap of thinking what psychologists would say is a desire to become a child again, to return to a state of dependence, have someone else look after me. After making a mess of his life, he decides that might be, just might be the wisest course for him. He was looking for an authority figure to whom he could turn, whom say, here, take over the running, the existence of my life, the burden of my life. Now here in a story form from the Bible is what I think Dr. Meminger is writing about in terms of sin and in terms of identity and power. It begins with the refusal to give a person her or his desires or desire to be in a relationship, and it always ends up, always with power being abused. Wasn't this the young man's problem? From beginning to end. He did not like the hand that he thought life had given him. He didn't like his place in the family because of his birth. He didn't like who he was, where he was, and this turned him into arrogance, and he attempted to become more than what he was. Yet, as you know, his efforts crashed against all of those realities that he wished to bend in the world to his own desires, and then he tried the other extreme. He tried to cop out, so the saying goes, he wanted to refuse the power that he had. He wanted others to take care of him, to take over in his life, tell him what to do. So if you ask me for a definition of sin, I say it's the refusal to be the person that God created you to be. And you can do that by being arrogant and overreaching or you can do it by being passive and underreaching in your potential. Again, it begins with identity 
and it always ends up with the misuse of power. However, this young man in the parable was very fortunate. He had a father who knew how to handle sin. He knew how to help his son begin to mature. I don't think it was easy for the father at this point. I don't think it would be easy for any earthly father. However, the father was wise enough to know that if this stubborn boy was going to learn what he refused to be taught at home, he would have to learn it from the school of hard knocks. The father was not overly protective, but he was indeed very, very wise. It would have been easy, I think, for the father to refuse his son his inheritance, which he had not earned. Or when he returned, it would have been easy to say, I told you so. You want to be a servant? I'll teach you what it's like to be a servant. You'll never forget the lesson that I am going to teach you. Nor did he say, it's okay, come on into the house, son. We're going to get a little cradle and we're going to make you a baby for the rest of your life. We're going to take care of you. We're going to make all of your decisions for you. That's not how the boy's father responded, as you know. He called for the rings and the sandal, the robe. He called for the fatted calf to be killed, saying, in effect, you can come back, but you can't come back as a child, and you can't come back as a servant. You know now you're not a superman. You know that you have limits. What you learned there in that far country. Now you must learn that you are not a servant either. And I challenge you to become what you were born to be in this family's business. Now that, I believe, is a wonderful example of the essence of our maturing process. And of course, it points us to the problem of sin. When we stop trying to be more or less of who we are, and we come home to what God has created us to be, we have the answer to the age-old problem of sin. Now, I'll say it again, this young man, he was very, very fortunate to have the kind of father he did, but here is the truth, and you know it already. All of us are. For you realize, do you not, that the father of this parable is clearly what our God is like. God is the one who knows how to help us mature. It is a clear picture of how our Creator God, our Father God, handles us when we come and we confess and we say, Father, I know that I am an incomplete being. And I know that you know what is best for me. Thy will be done, not mine. Because I don't want to be a servant and I don't want to be a baby. I'll never forget when that finally dawned upon me and my relationship with God, that it was a gift of grace. It was not something that I had ever earned, not for anything that I ever was or ever did. Just like the younger son and most of you, I grew up believing that God's love was somehow a connectional thing. That is, if I behaved properly, if I did what I was supposed to do, then I was loved. And if I did not, then I was not. What God is saying to us in this father's reaction indicated that what I was thinking and perhaps a lot of us were thinking is that it's not true at all. Once a son or daughter, always a daughter, always a son. We are all sons of daughters by the virtue of not what we have done, 
but by what God has done. And yet you and I, we have identity that we can claim and we have power that we can use. And we can refuse this relationship with God. That's what the younger son did. And he came up against realities in the world that he could not bend. So do we, when we refuse to live up to the privileges, the opportunities that come from being a child of the living God. Sin is first and foremost the refusal to be who you are, either by trying in more arrogance to bend the world to your wishes or to be lost in apathy. It begins with a problem of identity and it always ends in the misuse of power. But here we have good news. We have a God that is not easily discouraged just as the father in that parable had insight and the courage to help his son again after his son had failed. We are still, when we fail, children of the living God. And God has not given up on us, not by virtue of anything we have done, but because of what God has done in creating you. And I wonder, where do you find yourself in this story this morning? Do you find yourself in your arrogant phase, overreaching limits? Or do you find yourself in the apathetic phase, claiming that you have no power at all, underreaching your potential? Well, no matter where you are, I encourage you, come home. Come to the one who made you and waits there to help you toward your maturity. There is amazing grace to be found there. It is a grace that can heal and can forgive. The answer to our sin problem in our lives in our world today is let us come to meet the Creator Father who always is there to meet us. There is where you will find the answer in that great hymn, there is a balm in Gilead to heal your sin-sick soul. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. And now, my friends, let us say what we believe by rising and repeating together the Apostles' Creed. Let the children of God say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated by the God the Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn is number 411.
we depart this time that we have shared apart from the world, know that there is one who is able to meet you and to greet you and to present you faultless even before the throne of Almighty God, Jesus Christ. Go in his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.